What chapter do you think we're in? I heard a few different ones there. We are in chapter 4. That's the loudest I heard. So we'll, we'll go there just because that's what you want. <laughs> Genesis chapter 4. When you think of success, what comes to your mind? What's that? Money? I heard money. Prosperity? Accomplishing a goal, I think that's two people said that at the same time-ish. That's cool. What else, what else do you think of when you think of success? Joy and satisfaction. Okay, let me twist it just a little bit. And I don't know if you're even brave enough to answer this question. But I would be successful if or when. Anybody willing to brave that one? I will be successful when. What would, you, what would be the blank there for you? What's that? When I stop yelling. My family all wants to really serve the Lord. Okay. Anybody else? I'll be successful when? Yes. That's a good one. I'll pray for you on that one. No, I mean that seriously too. We all have some. Don't laugh at him. We're all we all understand that one. What else? Now, really what I should have done, okay? Because you're all kind of wimpy and you don't really want to say exactly what's really on your mind in order what you think that you it would make for you to be successful. You don't really want to say it out loud, most of you. Most of us, maybe we could say. I'm better off if I had, and I thought of doing this, actually giving you a piece of paper and having you write it down first so you didn't have to say it out loud, but then you might not have even done that because you'd been afraid I would have asked you what you wrote down. But the point is this, I want you to reflect just for a moment. What is it for you if this happened then I would be successful? What is it for you? We're not going to say it out loud. I want you to think about that. This comes in, is a really valid thing to be thinking of because whatever we think success looks like is always what we're striving for to some degree. Or maybe we could say even for those who are lazy and don't really want to strive too much, it's still what maybe depresses you or brings self-pity on yourself because you're not attaining it. You get that? Either way, it's wrong, right? So success, for sure, affects what your view of success is for your own life, personally, affects the way that you live your life now and the way that life uh, affects you day by day. So, question would say is maybe do you consider yourself successful right now? Well, we're going to this morning look at uh, the contrast of two successful families. Not that one's successful and one's not. We're going to look at two successful families this morning and see a difference in what makes that family successful. Are you with me? Are you ready? Do you dare? Okay, let's, let's pray before we get into the Word this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your Word. I thank you, Lord, that it is relevant and it is real and that the people in it are just like us one way or another. And it's not, you know, super spiritual people in it. It's everybody. It's those who are striving to live for you, those who don't care about you, those who are in the middle, those who are, go back and forth, just like we are. And so, Lord, use your word this morning to challenge us. Number one, is if we're parents, challenge us. But number, challenge us also in our individual lives that what, on um, what should be what we base our success upon. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, Genesis chapter 4, we finished off last time. Cain had killed his brother Abel. And so he had been, what did God do to him? Kicked him out of his presence, but he'd already been kind of done, and he had to be a what? What did he tell him he had to be? A wanderer, thank you. A wanderer. <laughs> 
We're going to look at what happens next. That's where we're going to pick up with this morning, Genesis chapter 4, 17. We're going, to first, we're going to look at two successful families, and the first one is going to be Cain's. Okay? That's the first successful family we're going to look at. Cain had relations with his... Okay. Number, verse 16. We ended with it last time, but I want to begin with it in it today. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. He built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son, now to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad became the father of Mah I actually was thinking of asking one of you guys to read this. Mahudiel, and Mahudiel became the father of Methushel, and Methushel became the father of Lamech. Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. And Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and flute pipe. As for Zilla, she, um, she also gave birth to Dubal Cain, the forger of all implements of bronze and iron, and his sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zilla, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech, give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy sevenfold. The successful family of Cain. What, we start right off with Cain understanding where he's headed. Because God told him to be a wanderer on the earth, and what does it say that he did? He went to the land of Nod and did what? Settled there. Does that sound like a wanderer? Number one, he leaves the presence of the Lord and is in outright disobedience to what God has put on his life. He builds, he, and then what does he do next? He settles there and he does what? He builds a city. That's prosper. Prosperity, wouldn't it be? A city is what represents everything that life has to offer. It represents the wealth. It represents uh, economic value. It represents all of, you know, we may say we don't like to live in cities, but still it represents everything that this world has to offer at, at our fingertips. So would we say then, if Cain built a city... We would say he's successful that way. We say maybe he's successful, maybe we can stretch a little bit, he's successful economically. Well, fathers, anybody here who has an influence on, some, on younger people, what, if, what happens in your life, in what, the way you view success, will affect those who are under you, will affect those who are watching you children, other people's children, whatever. Those who are watching you, the young people, will see what's important in your life. And we'll get back to that a little bit in, in a while. But let's just see with Cain. So he's distanced himself from God, and that's no big deal to him. He's disobeyed God in outright defiance of what God has told him, and that's no big deal to him. But before we say, well, he's not a success, let's look at his children. Because it's a lot of times, we, I don't know about you, but a lot of times I've come to this passage and, and, I, and I would say, that, you know, that the godly line of Seth is great and, and then Cain's Seth is all evil. But it's not just all, it's not necessarily all evil. There's good that's going on. Because look at each one of his sons. He built a city, had many children. Would we say that's a prosperous thing? If you'd like to have children, it is, right? But, it, but it's in this economy, in this time period, it for sure was a, a success to have children. Because anywhere in the Old Testament where you see a, a woman who's barren, that's kind of a negative, right? And if you've read the Bible at all, you'll see that. So, so they've had success with, you could say, maybe their economics and where they lived. They've had success with even being able to have uh, children and family that continues to have more family. And then look also at each one. Each one of his sons is a leader. Look at this. Um, verse... Uh, where is it? Starting with 20. Jabal, it says, was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. Did anybody have livestock before this? Trick question, maybe, but not really. Anybody have livestock before this of any kind? Abel. Right, because what did he offer? Yeah, he offered a lamb, so he had life. So it's not the idea that nobody else had livestock, so we'll get to that in a little bit. And the brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who played the lyre and the pipe, or that would be any musical instrument. 
Tubal Cain was a forger of influence of bronze and iron. By the way, our world tries to tell us that uh, the old people, you know, the time the first men were stupid. No, they were actually very smart because God made them perfect and they actually could use all of their brain. What do they say how much of our brain we can use? I mean, I know some of us it's more or less, but, but as a general rule, huh? 10%. And we look around and we say, you know, I, I wonder how much of yours you're using. But still, that's not the point, is we don't use 100% of it anymore, right? But they did at this point in time. They were smart. So this idea that Cain's children, all, uh, Cain's sons here, all were the father. That idea of father can mean founder. It can mean possessor of. But it has the idea that they were leaders in their occupation. They were the ones to look to. In other words, they'd be like the, oh, what's the guy who did Microsoft there? There we go. And everybody looked to him for certain things in that industry, wouldn't you say? This would be the kind of the idea of it. So each one of these guys, you would look to them if you wanted a musical instrument or to have a musical instrument brought to him to have him see if it was worthwhile or not. They were the leaders in their industry. Now, would we call that success? Come on, simply put, would we call that success? He, this was, Cain had a line of men who were successful in what they did. They were leaders in what they did in the world. And, and even in Christianity, we would say this is successful to a point. Also, we could say they're successful in this because sometimes uh, we look at self-confidence as being successful, don't we? Look at Lamech. Let's read what he wrote, and then we'll just pick a couple things out of there. He said to his wives, Listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. We could say that he was very self-confident. In other words, he took matters into his own hands because he didn't need anybody else to do it for him. Would we say that might be a level of success? I mean, maybe you don't want to say it right now, but when we say that somebody can do for themselves and don't need others to do it for them, we would call that some sort of success, wouldn't we? We actually like that to happen in the workplace, don't we? If you work with somebody, do you always want to cover for them because they're not doing what they should be? You want to? What were we supposed to pray for you for? Um, <laughs> so the idea is that, yes, we could say we, we know that could be wrong, but, but still there is some sort of success there that they don't have to be coddled all the time. They can make things happen and get stuff done, right? Even if we'd say he shouldn't be killing these guys, but we don't know. We don't know the exact circumstance. But what we do know is he did it, and he's bragging about it, that he didn't need anybody to help him. He's self-confident. He's able... And this is the key thing. He's able to succeed in life without God. He's able to succeed in life without God. Remember David, you read some of the Psalms, and over and over again you see David saying, Why do the wicked prosper around me, and yet I'm trying to live for you, Lord, and look at all the things that go wrong. Look at how hard it is. And it looks like those wicked people, they're flourishing and they don't even have to work at it. It just, everything, they've got golden fingers. Whatever they touch turns to gold. I'm sure we've had those thoughts too, haven't we? If you're a believer and you've said, you know, why does it have to be so hard? Why can't it be easier? Like, wouldn't it be easier just to? And the saddest, worst thing that can ever happen to the life of a believer, and I've seen it happen, is when believers get to that point where they give up on God and they do life without Him and it goes well. Because guess what? If you're only living for God so it goes well, you, you don't get it anyway. You don't really know. You don't really understand the gospel. The gospel, you didn't come to Christ so that He could fix all your problems. If you did, you don't really understand the gospel. You come to Christ because you need Him as a Savior of your sins. Not as the one to fix all your problems. That's why, by the way, this is a little extra for you. When Jesus came 2,000 years ago, 
and he presented himself as their savior for their sin, they weren't that happy about it because they just wanted him to fix their problems. And what was their biggest problem at that time? Under Rome, right? He wanted to, they wanted him to set himself up as king. They didn't care if he was their savior. He, they, only want, he, they only wanted Jesus to save them from the hardship they were in, not to save them from their personal sin. That's why they rejected it. And that's so easy to get caught up with, isn't it? But Cain's family line was able to be successful without God. That's a scary place to be. It is so hard, and the Bible talks about the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for the camel to go through an eye of a needle. And you're like, that's ridiculous. And so didn't his disciples say that. That's impossible. But Jesus said this. Yes, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. It's never impossible for somebody who has it going well to get saved. But it is for sure not as likely, isn't it? Because they think they've got it all under control. And it's even worse, though, when it's a believer who starts to do life without God. When they know the Savior who saved them how much he did for them and loved them. All right, so Cain's family is not necessarily unsuccessful. It's very successful, but it's successful without God. So let's keep going on and see the, the contrast of another successful family and what that looks like. Sets. So verse 25, Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth, to him also was a son born, and he called his name Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Okay, what did we start with in a verse with Cain? Do you remember? Remember that verse? What did it say at the beginning? He went out from the presence of the Lord. What do we see now that we come to the line of Seth? Then... Man began to call upon the name of the Lord. Is that a contrast? Went out from the presence of the Lord, going into the presence of the Lord. Let's make it simple, right? Use different words, but same idea. Totally contrasted. All right. So let's look at what does that mean? He had many children too, right? By the way, if you want to have some good um, names for children, if you're going to have children someday, look right here in chapter 5. You'll get a whole list of them. You all probably have to have somebody smarter than you help you pronounce them. And then maybe you can name your kid. All right, but this is what it says in chapter 5, starting with kind of, kind of a recap he does a little bit. This is the book of the generations of Adam and the day when God created him. He made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and he blessed them and named them man in the day they were created. When Adam lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness according to his image and named him Seth. Then it goes on and on and on how many days everybody was alive. Now, there's an idea here that, uh, that I've always taught this, that, um, you know, when God created man in his own image, he created him in the image of God, right? And that here, he's saying now he's created in the image of Adam. There's a reality of that. It's a difference. What is made in the image of Adam different from made in the image of God? One word, three letters. Sin. Right? Sin makes that difference between the two. But I think there's something else going on here too. Because he's not talking about Cain. He's just talked about Cain. Now he's focusing on Seth. So I think he's trying to say also something else. We know that's true, that, that he's in the line of Adam, and now he, they are born with sin. But there's another aspect here, because look what he says. He says, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. He didn't say that about the other Cain, did he? It's almost like he's starting over again here. Starting over maybe with that godly legacy. I think there's maybe that, that's in the context a little bit here. And that's why he's saying starting with Seth. Seth is now a godly man. We see that based on the last verse of chapter 4. The man began to call upon the name of the Lord when Seth had a son named Enosh. So let's look 
and see what it says about their line. And we're not going to read all these verses. I just wanted to take you to a couple verses that, sh that actually say something about the person and just don't say when they died and were born and all that. Verse 21. It picks out one of these men, Enoch. And Enoch lived 65 years, and he became the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. We do not know, by the way, you can look at all the... You don't, you don't know anybody's occupation until you get to Noah. They're not saying the occupation doesn't matter, but occupation isn't the most important thing. You get that? What is the most important thing? That they walk with God. That they walk with God. They called on the name of the Lord. Enoch. I just want to look at a couple verses just to, uh, in, through, in the New Testament on Enoch. In it, uh, Hebrews chapter 11. He doesn't tell about what they did for an occupation. doesn't tell about how good he was with other people. They bring out this point that he walked with God. Hebrews 11. Uh, verses um, 5 and 6. Say this. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness before his being taken up that he was pleasing to God. And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. What is the thing about Enoch? We see that, his faith, that he had faith and his faith led to pleasing God. Jude 14 and 15 talks about him also. The second to last book of the Bible, only one chapter. Jude 14 and 15 says it was about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy angels to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You say, well, what about all that? The point is this. Enoch walked with God... And he was a preacher. He spoke, and you can use preacher in many different aspects, but the point is, he was warning people. He was warning people about what was to come, trying to get them back in right relation with God. Because by the time Enoch comes along, it's been hundreds of years, many people have been born, and we see in the line of Cain that it doesn't look like there's God in their line at all. So there's many people on earth who need to hear about the, the Lord, and Enoch is used to preach them about and to warn them about what's to come. Why did he do that? Because he walked with God. How do you walk with God? By faith. What does faith do? Lead you to living a life that's pleasing to God. Enoch walked with God. And his faith showed that he pleased him. It's because of his faith, he pleased him. Look at one more person. It's kind of long, in the same line. The only other person it says a lot about, but we're only going to read a couple verses for this week. And that is Noah. And I'm sure you've heard of Noah. Noah, so uh, that'd be, I guess we hear about him first at the end of chapter 5. <laughs> and Lamech was his dad, but it's a different Lamech than the other one, so don't get too confused. Lived, uh, it's verse 28, 182 years and became the father of a son. And now he called his name Noah saying, This one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. So his father knew there was something special about his son and that God was going to do something in his life. Then Lamech lived 500, had other sons and daughters. Okay, so he died. All right, another verse I want to read. Go back over to chapter 6 and when it tells us who, what Noah was like. Verse 9. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. What do we see about a person again? He did what? Walked with God. How do you walk with somebody? Jeremy, come on up here. Go ahead and walk that way. Am I walking with him? Am I walking with him? 
Am I walking with him? Okay, you got that one, right? How do, how, what does it mean to walk with him? Can we do this? One, two, one, two. Okay, that's walking with him, right? The idea is to walk in step with, right? It means to go the same place that they go, do the same things they do at the same time as they do it. God desires us to walk with him, to be in step with him. In other words, we're doing what God wants us to do. We're living a life that pleases him. Look at, uh, look at Hebrews 11.7 and what it talks about Noah. Going back there, back to the Bible. By faith, Noah, being warned by God, about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world, became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So because of Noah walked with God, it was, that was a phrase used of him in Genesis, and his faith showed by his obedience. It says that he was told about something he'd never seen. The idea there maybe is this, that they had never seen rain. There's an idea that maybe there was just a mist. I only can picture that like with a tropical rainforest type thing on the earth at that time. That's what we, it seems to look like. But the point is, we know that there was something he had never seen and didn't understand, and God told him to do it anyway, and he obeyed. That's faith in action. We see about Enoch, his faith led to pleasing God. We see about Noah, his faith led to obedience. Look at... Uh, 2 Peter 2, 5. And the same way we looked at um, Enoch, we'll look at Noah. 2 Peter 2, 5. And it says this. And did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So think of this. Noah was a preacher, the other, you could say the other one preached, and preach means to speak and tell, and, and, and Enoch warned people of what was to come, but pre, the, um, Noah was a preacher of righteousness during the darkest hour this world has ever had. We do not live in the darkest hour this world has ever had. There is another dark hour coming, but we ain't there yet. There's still light here. In fact, they even say in New England that there's more light of the gospel than there was 20 years ago. A statistic just came out, and it said that, that New England doesn't look quite as dark as it used to. I remember him saying how dark it was when, when we were in Bryanton, and, and I kept hearing how dark New England was, and you'd have these people come because they were going to come to the dark area. And I remember thinking, it don't look too dark to me. People are getting saved. But the statistics show this time that actually... There has been more people getting saved in New England, and it's, in, and it's being recorded. We don't live in the darkest time ever, but Noah preached righteousness in the darkest time that mankind has ever had. By the way, we're going to need, if that darkest time comes while we're alive, but it's already coming, we, God needs and wants people to be preaching of righteousness in the midst of darkness. In the midst of when wickedness is called right, God wants us preaching the truth of what is right through his word. But Noah was a preacher of righteousness in the darkest hour. It said he was blameless. Blameless doesn't mean he was perfect, but it was that idea of that attitude of striving to be right before God continually. Striving to be right before God continually. So, let me ask you this. And I know you want to be spiritual. Is somebody successful if they live a life of faith and strive to please Him with everything they do? Of course you'd say yes. You're the church. You're in church even, I should say. Of course you'd say yes because you're in church. But it's true. And God views that as a, a successful life. He doesn't say, this is, but you got to be careful a little bit. It doesn't mean that what Cain's sons were accomplishing was not successful. 
The point is this. It wasn't the most successful thing they could do. And in light of being successful for the Lord, it meant nothing. See, the key isn't that we should just do nothing. Because actually Paul, because some of the early Christians were waiting for Christ to come back. I think it was in Thessalonians. He, he reprimanded them. Because they started quitting their jobs and being lazy and laying around and saying, Jesus will come back. And expecting other people to support him. And he said, no, get back out, work. You don't know when he'll come back. Keep working until he gets here. So we've got to be careful we don't go to that extreme. But the point is, what is pleasing to God? How can we be successful? Now, one thing that really burdens me, and that is this. Parents, what are you showing your children is the most successful thing they can do or be? The words that you say on what you talk about highly and what you talk about mostly will show them what you value as important and success. Do you get that? What they hear come out of your mouth most of the time or to maybe a higher degree of volume, <laughs> is what they believe is most important to you and will therefore be what they will struggle with to be most important to them. And I mean struggle with if it's opposite of what they should be thinking. It will be a struggle for the rest of their life because parents, what you are influencing your children with today will always influence them. I say this, your past influences who you are today. It doesn't make you because you have a choice. Like for you adults, no matter what your parents taught you growing up, you have a choice on how you respond to that and whether you, whether you take the word of God when it's wrong and go, go towards God or not, you have a choice. But reality is you're still influenced. And it will be tough to counteract it. So, parents, what you say, what comes out of that mouth of yours is always telling your kids what you value as success. Parents, what you do with your time. What you make sacrifices for. What are those things in your life that no matter what, you're going to do those. We'll show your kids what success is and what is most important to you. There are a lot of good things that we can do. And I, I'm going to step on some, some toes. We just came through hunting season. Is, that, is it successful to shoot a buck? I, yes, I'm going to say it is. Yes, it's awesome. It's good. If that, and, and this can go with anything. I'm going to use that because it's right now and I know it's going to bother a few of you. <clears throat> oh, did I say that out loud? But if your children know that hunting comes before God in the morning for you to do your, be in the word, or you miss every Sunday during hunting season because that is more important to you than God, that's a problem. And I have no shame in saying it. It's okay to miss church once in a while to go hunting. That's, that is, I'll say that too because I don't want you to get an extreme of this. But if you're... Children, know that's a non-negotiable for you no matter what else happens and God is always put to the side for it. Guess what you just told them? What is success? Whether you get a deer. And you know that this could go on many things that, that are okay things to do. Some of you play golf. And if you're missing every Sunday during the best golf season, there's a problem. Or you're showing your children what's most important. Is it okay to miss once in a while? Yes. But you know, you know, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit will show you if you're missing too much. I, there is no doubt about that. Because he loves you too much to let you go. Is it okay to miss some things? Yes. But you, just remember this. What are you doing with your time will show your kids what success is. If they always see you, or in the morning, in the Word, moms and dads, no matter how much sleep you got the night before, or sometime during that day, it could be, whatever, 
they're going to know that God matters to you. They're going to know. Because what you will do when it'd be easier to do something else shows what's important to you. And your children watch you. Shows what success is. Our life shows what's most important to us. Our focus, our time, our words, and our money. Where do they go? We'll show our children what success is to us. All right, so your family. We talked about two successful families. Now we want to talk about your family. I only see a few concerns around there. Good. We're going to look at this. A parent's challenge. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. We're actually going to talk about our family, each one of us individually. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 9 through 12. It says this. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of, of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you, believers. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one, one of you as a father with his own children, so that you would walk, here it goes again, in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. It's Paul talking to the Thessalonians. But think of it as, a, as parents talk about your children. Would they say this about you as we open this up? Look at what he says. The, uh, for you recall, he's saying, you remember? Can you say this to your children? You remember those times? Where, I, where we labored and we worked to do what? To get more money so that we could buy another car? No, what does he say? We labored and worked to proclaim to you the gospel. Parents, is that your biggest thing that you work on? Are you sweating so that you can get the gospel sh shown to your children? So that they can see what's the most important decision in their life. They're hearing it. They're seeing it lived out. And it, they know that it matters so much to you that you'll stay up late at night to talk to them when you have those times, especially with teenagers. That you'll go to things where that they will hear the gospel said because instead of doing something else, because it matters that much to you. Are you laboring and toiling to reach your kids with the gospel of Christ? Or are you just saying, well, the church should do it? Or youth group should do it? Or the other people in the church should do it? Or is it really, purposefully, are you working to say it and to live it before them so that they see and hear the gospel and truly see how much it matters to them? So right here it says that he labored to speak the gospel. Also, he says... Um, the next verse, say at 10, you are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you, believers. W is, would that be what our children see? That we are trying to live blameless lives, and they're seeing how much, how devout we are to do that. Not that we're perfect, because then we've lost it all. Because if we go that route, and we think we're ever perfect, then we've blown it for our kids, because they don't understand grace. But the point is, we can't be perfect, but are we striving to be? Do they see that it matters to be blameless by the words that we say, by the things that we do, but what we show is important to them? Do they see that we strive to, even though we continue to fail, we strive to live blamelessly before them? Because that's what we believe success is. Keep going. Just as you, verse 11... Know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each of you as a father with his own children. Encouraging what? That you would walk in a manner worthy. Are we encouraging? What was uh, exhorting means to build up? Are we truly coming alongside our children to help them to walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling that God has for them? Is that a goal? Is that a desire? Is that what motivates us? As we strive to live with our children, 
And by the way, you cannot be a parent and you still might have children in your life. I'm going to say probably all of you do at some level that you can influence. So if you're not a parent, don't write this off. Are you building up and encouraging them to live in a manner worthy of the gospel? All right, well, that's a parent's challenge. Wouldn't you say that was kind of a challenge? Would you say that that was a challenge that God would say is a challenge for success? For us to be in the lives of our kids? For us to, to be like, yes. Well, let's, let's see a parent's hope. Look at verse 13. So I said a parent's challenge, parent's hope. Verse 13, for this reason. So why do we do all this? <laughs> we caught, so no, I should say, why is he praying? I'm sorry. For this reason, we also constantly thank God. Why are they thanking God? That when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, not because mom and dad or whoever you are to that person said it, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. What is our hope as a parent? What is my hope as a parent? That my children see... The word of God as from God and not just what their parents are telling them. Anybody concerned about that sometimes? That's why, by the way, if you want to, if you want to help that, when you tell them not to do something, you better have a good reason for it. If it's just your preference, you may want to rethink it and, and let them and say yes instead. Make sure you have few rules and they're based on the word of God. And that way they can always go back to this is the truth of the word of God that my parents are trying to put into my life. It's not just their preferences and what irritates them. You get that? Because that can be a problem. So my desire would be, for sure, my hope is that my children would see. When they see the gospel in me ever, sometimes, lived out, that they would realize it's not just my words, it's God. I hope that would be your, everyone's parent, every parent's here hope. They would accept it from God instead of us. Look at Colossians 1, over a couple pages to your left. It'll be our last passage we look at this morning. I said the parent's challenge, I said the parent's hope, and this is the parent's prayer. It's Paul's prayer, but it, it would be a good parent's prayer too. Colossians 1, 9. For this reason also, since we... The day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you. By the way, that's a good challenge as parents. Are you praying for your children? Okay, now, are you never ceasing to pray for your children? Is it a daily thing? When you see things come up, are you praying because you're seeing differences? If you have many kids, you, you should be able to see this because none of them are the same, right? Is that true? You can't deal with everyone exactly the same, except for when you come to truth, truth is always the same. But are you truly praying, and praying uniquely for each one of those children, not the same, because they're not the same. They have different struggles, they have different um, gifts, they have different uh, triumphs, you know, that they're good at and stuff. So are you praying? He says, we have not ceased to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. In all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner, there's that word again, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Let's pick out just a few things there. What is He praying for? Number one, for them to know God's will. Parents, are you praying for your children that they would know God's will? Is it sometimes a little confusing? Like, does he want me to go this way? Does he want me to go that way? We all have that struggle if we care, right? And I think that's a great prayer. Lord, help my children to know your will. To know your will for their life. Also, right in this text, he keeps going on. He says, that they would please the Lord. I don't know about you, but I pray, Lord, please don't help my kids to just be another casual Christian who amounts to nothing in this world for you. But may they be men and women who are 
on the battlefield who actually care about the lost and desire to see them saved and want to help them to grow? Are you, are you praying for your children that they would not be just another Christian who lives life and has their ticket to heaven? Because we get enough of them already. We need Christians who will stand for the Word of God. We need Christians who will stand in truth, not weirdly, but confidently because they believe it. And it matters. That people are seeing the love of God through them. People are seeing the grace of God through them. But also people are seeing the truth of God in them. That's what we need. We need some more soldiers for Christ. Are we praying that they please Him? Are we praying that they bear fruit? That's in this text too which would go along with what I just said. Are we praying that they would increase in the knowledge of God? In other words, they wouldn't just stay, you know, get saved and just stay. Or some of you understand this, you do go through times in, in plateau in Christianity, don't you? You get saved and you grow. And then you kind of, seems like you don't grow. <laughs> you, you plateau or you go backwards. And then you grow again. We understand those cycles. But what is not good is when we stay in the down cycle. That is not healthy for any of us. So are we praying for our kids that they would increase in the knowledge? We're not talking about knowledge to have more head knowledge. We're talking about knowledge that's experienced. In other words, it's a knowledge that continues to be worked out in our life. Are you praying for your kids that they would have that kind of knowledge from God? And that they would be strengthened by Him. Not by what the world says. Not be because they've done enough things right but because of the God who saved them. And then, lastly, are we praying that they have an attitude of thankfulness? It's easy for us as parents to condemn our kids that they're not thankful, isn't it? You little punk, what I did for you and, you, and you're not thankful? But are we praying that they would be thankful? Are we praying that they would have that attitude of gratitude in their life? Because tell you what, if they have an attitude of thankfulness, that is visible to a lost and dying world who does not see it much. Question this morning. Number one, do you consider yourself successful? Which family is it based on? The family of Cain? Or the family of Seth? The family that went out from the presence of the Lord? Or the family that drew and called upon the name of the Lord? Parents, what are you teaching your kids is success? That's a challenge for all of us, isn't it? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and, and even just the clarity we see in these two families of the distinct difference. Lord, we know that as parents and we do have a lot of influence. We thank you for your grace, though, that even in spite of our negative influence, our kids can come toward you and in spite of us. We do thank you for that. But Lord, this morning, I pray that you would challenge us. Show us those areas that right now, practically speaking, where if we had to say so, we would have to say that we're showing our kids that what this world has to offer is success. Not really what they do with you. Lord, help us to see it and help us to even know how to start going in the other direction to show our kids, not that those things don't matter, the things of this world, and that they don't matter, but that they matter less than being successful in your eyes, than being, having a success that is based on their relationship with you. Help us to live that out, Lord. Help us to desire it first, to live it out. And Lord, help us to teach it to those who we have influence on. Thank you, Lord, that you even care. In Jesus' name, amen.